Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. My name is Martin Loffers. I'm uh, the Chief Tent Watcher of Supply Chain Media. You might also know me as the Chief of Supply Chain Movement, European Quarterly, and also LinkedIn Group and a website and email newsletter. We have a, a great uh, live webinar coming up. Uh, we're going to talk about end-to-end -end transport management. And uh, we have a, well, a great uh, panel here to explain uh, about this uh, topic. So on the left, uh, you see me, Martin Loffers, and next to me, I have three uh, experts about this matter. First, uh, Carolyn Hunt from Alpega TMS. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here, Martin. And next, we have two Michaels. But uh, first, we have uh, Mike, Mike Buckler, also from Alpega. Mike, welcome. Hello, together. And last but not least, we have uh, uh, Michael Bulo from uh, Arco, a manufacturing company. We'll be here uh, introducing later. So, Michael, uh, welcome. Yeah. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Yes. So, first to explain, uh, this webinar will be recorded. Um, so, and uh, this recording will be made avail available within the 48 hours. And also, uh, presentation will be made available as PDF later on. Um, so everybody, the whole audience is on mute, but you have an opportunity to ask questions. There are two ways, either by chat. Uh, so the first question would be, do we get uh, the slides? And if someone else can say, yes, you get the slides. So uh, if you have questions for the audience, please use uh, the questions function. Um, and you see the, the question mark on the right hand side. Uh, so and, and people can also vote on the questions. So uh, basically, uh, I can track down what are the most popular questions. Um, if you have questions about what's being discussed, and it's in line of this discussion, I will, uh, you know, include this question right away. So uh, you can have an inter interaction with uh, the experts. Um, and next, at the end, uh, we have also a Q&A for questions. And if you still want to talk more after the hour, so at 5 o'clock CET, we have 30 minutes also. When you go uh, into uh, the uh, the lounge and can uh, talk to uh, the experts directly, then you get in a kind of Zoom meeting. Um, um, so we don't have the cameras off, but we are live. You can enlarge your slides. You see the four small rows on the upper right uh, of the screen, so you can enlarge uh, your your slides to uh, to look closer to the slides uh, to read it. So that's uh, well uh, the logistical part of this webinar. Let's start start with the uh, the topic itself. But first, uh, Carolyn, can you explain of Pega TMS who you are? I would be very happy to. So yes, thanks very much for for hosting here, Martin. Um, on the screen, you'll see the vision of uh, Pega as a whole, and I think our vision for supply chain collaboration really carries with it the power to drive truly end to end transportation management. And that's come through bringing shippers, and by shippers, I mean manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, uh, closer to their suppliers and their carriers. And by creating a holistic view of the supply chain, we get real collaboration. We know with global pandemics and major shifts in demand, we see our solution as vital in optimizing how goods are transported in order to um, make sure to meet customer demands while minimizing emissions and at the same time ensuring resilience and adaptation to market conditions. So our customers can really position themselves for success using our solutions by understanding the many areas where uh, logistics can make an impact in the bigger business goals. Great. And could you explain something about what do you offer as Alpega TMS? Yeah, of course. So uh, practically speaking, we are a technology company. So we offer software solutions um, and manufacturers, retailers uh, of all sizes and levels of supply chain complexity are turning to digital solutions like ours to tackle their logistics processes efficiencies and to gain some much needed visibility. So Alpega TMS allows all the parties involved uh, in the process of shipping goods to have the latest status and customizable alerts about the shipments that are being executed. So our users can focus on what really matters and automate the rest. Uh, beyond that, we also connect Alpega TMS with our freight exchanges and enable direct access to freight capacities via our Alpega hub. Um, so those two pieces of the Alpega group really fit nicely together. 
and and, and it's all cloud based. Uh, Correct. Yes, so that's important to to connect to all other parties and uh, absolutely roll out. We will discuss it later. Um, maybe some facts and figures to, to wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so here are some basic facts and figures about Alpega. The main message here. I'm not going to go through each one in detail. Uh, but the main message here is that we have the scale and the experience to help uh, companies like Agco, for example, who is our featured guest today, uh, to roll out a truly end-to-end -end PMS. And um, I think Mike is going to talk in a minute more about what we mean by an end-to-end -end PMS. Okay, all right. Uh, Mike, yeah, maybe up to you. Well, can you explain, well, yeah, we'll talk about end-to-end -end, uh, transport management, but can you explain what it is? Of course, many thanks. Uh, so um, at, at first, let me frame it a little bit more high level even. So when we are talking about transportation, of course, we are talking about uh, all different kinds of material flows, meaning inbound, outbound, but also in the company transports. And when we are talk about TMS, we also include all kinds of uh, transport modes, meaning road, air, ocean, and parcel. Why are we doing that? Because we are uh, convinced that, of course, the bigger you take the network, the bigger you uh, can uh, create saves. So that's a little bit the high level framing. And now coming to our Alpega end to end TMS cycle. So typically we are uh, starting off the process with a network design. So that's that's kind of a strategic part. Uh, here you really answer questions like, where should my hub be located, for instance? So that's an uh, exercise you're doing typically on an on a annual basis, uh, so not very frequent. You're pulling um, different scenarios, uh, compare them, and then decide how should your uh, strategic transportation network look like. This is also the main uh, outcome of this uh, process step which then leads very often into strategic sourcing questions. Uh, so you see that you need, for instance, additional uh, lanes to be sourced on road. Uh, you need to do an air tender. Whatever you need there, the strategic sourcing supports you in order to digitize this sourcing process to analyze uh, the different offerings you get. And then, of course, finally, um, decide for which carrier you want to go. So select the best carrier which then leads to the next step because of course uh nominating the carrier is not uh the last stage you you then need to take that into consideration in the tactical optimization which comes along with a more frequent replanning of your network you have more accurate data this is typically done on a weekly monthly basis already uh, so it's still on demand, uh, transport demand. And here you once more verify if your network is uh, giving you the best options through the network. In this tackle optimization, you very often identify you have full trucks planned, but you need to change, for instance, the frequency of the full trucks in order to get them really uh, utilized properly. Um, you change from a LTN model into a milk run model for instance. So that's the uh, key decisions and, uh, and, and aspects in the tactical optimization, which then lead, and that's the third stage of uh, planning then, uh, into the operational planning. So now we move into more execution uh, world. Uh, that means you're not uh, doing everything on demand planned data. Here you now have the real transport order in the system, which is effectively an um, outbound delivery out of the ERP or is a PO you have to deliver. And uh, in that stage, you once more verify, for instance, if your truck is really utilized with the uh, as is transports. And in that stage, you uh, squeeze out even more out of your planned network and can uh, save uh, transport costs. At the end uh, of such a process, in some cases, you can uh, identify that you have transport demands where you do not have um, sourced uh, lanes, for instance. Um, that's then uh, very often handled what we can see in a spot sourcing. So really going out to the 
carriers and ask them for specific load, uh, a specific price. One um, use case I would say for spot sourcing, but uh, we, we see customers uh, using that functionality also quite often for benchmarking their uh, contracted rates um, or really go out to spot market also in air ocean tenders. So that's the spot sourcing. At the end of those two uh, steps, we now really go into the shipment execution. Uh, shipment execution starts, of course, with assigning the carrier, uh, but it then goes down from really tracking the status um, from pickup down to proof of delivery. And that's, of course, uh, also very often uh, and, and more commonly uh, linked into that real-time visibility network um, aspect. That means our TMS, of course, is uh, linked directly with the carriers, uh, but we are also utilizing um, RTV provider, we call them, uh, like Shipio, P44, uh, and Forkites, in order to really other uh, real-time ETA information or localization information. Of course, that's giving you back uh, nice information you can uh, can act on. Also in that area of shipment execution, we see, of course, it's not only a, a around transport, uh, it's also um, entering into the yard management topic. So how to best utilize uh, your docks and, and the equipment at the docks, as well as avoiding peaks, for instance, on your yard uh, is, is kind of an quite commonly used add-on we see, we call smart dock booking, deeply integrated in the overall process. And then freight cost management, of course, taking all executed transports, regardless of the uh, mode of transport, take them, calculate based on the freight rates, uh, and then go into a claiming process. Uh, we see very commonly in Europe, especially, that self-billing is the, uh, the process of choice because it's delivering the most accurate and, and lowest effort uh, for your freight cost uh, management at the end. And we close the loop, of course, by, uh, by taking all the data we collect from planning down to uh, real-time visibility uh, into our operational dashboards as well into, as into our uh, performance analysis. Uh, just a few KPIs um, typically used, of course, carrier performance uh, on time in full. Um, very often, of course, also freight cost analysis uh, down to uh, total lender costs are uh, part of this uh, performance analysis. So that's how we define end to end. So it's really about all transports and it's starting from a strategic point and is going down to the deep, deep execution because at the end it has to be at the right time at the right place. Uh, an important thing uh, I know uh, I'll peg a team as quite well that you have integrated both inbound and outbound. So those are not separate worlds anymore. Definitely. So that's that's bearing uh, quite a lot of um, of transport synergies. Of course, you can consolidate partially, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the industry and, of course, on your specific network. Yes, that's that's correct. So we combine those two definitely. Yeah. I got a question from the audience, um, and maybe we you can uh, relate to that uh, in the next slide. Where do you see the starting point of a TMS, and where does it end in the customer's information chain? Maybe you can explain also the, the level of, uh, well, the roadmap of TMS with that uh, question. Yep, uh, sure. Uh, so, so what we see is uh, the TMS topic uh, very often is embedded in a wider um, supply chain digitization roadmap. And now knowing that, of course, transportation, uh, transportation costs, but also uh, transportation in regards of resilience uh, and ensuring uh, the resilience of your overall supply chain is essential. We see that uh, the TMS itself is uh, quite uh, centered into that uh, overall supply chain uh, roadmaps. Now, looking a little bit deeper into the uh, TMS um, roadmaps we see, uh, we basically distinguished uh, three maturity levels we identified. Um, you can see uh, as a starting point, very often uh, we, we see requirements around um, 
execution, so starting collaboration, uh, integrate the carriers, but also, especially in, on the inbound side, uh, integrate the suppliers, as also uh, is the case for Echo. Um, I will that, explain that a little bit more. Uh, is essential in order to really create one platform for all uh, participants in, in, in the transport chain. So that's, I would say, maturity level one integrated. Uh, the next level we, we see is then based on this uh, visibility created uh, that uh, customers really go into advanced planning and optimization uh, topics, which of course uh, delivers then quite uh, interesting and nice uh, freight cost uh, reduction options. Uh, that's that's the stage we call strategic. And uh, last level we see, and uh, by the way, Echo is on, on the hop to that level, uh, currently is the horizontal uh, level. So that's um, the maturity level where you have basically done everything house in your supply chain you can do. Now, uh, what we see, especially also in the light of uh, limited freight capacities, but also infrastructure, road, uh, as well as rail and, and so on is, is, is limited. We see that, um, customers are going more and more into discussions to really collaborate regarding transportation cross company. So meaning really uh, planning and executing, uh, having this material on, on the same truck, even if they are competitors. So that's something we see uh, will come into truth more and more. Uh, I would say in the next three to five years, um, it will turn from a competitive advantage uh, into a uh, must have even. So that's this aspect. And what comes along with that uh, is also, and, and that's something Michael will elaborate uh, much more on, um, is also the operating mode of TMS is changing. So, uh, the pre-TMS phase, typically, uh, transportation is outsourced to an LSP. You have four or five regional LSPs and no TMS in place, no transparency. So that's even the pre-TMS phase in that execution. Uh, so integrated strategic uh, maturity levels, we see in-house organizations with the TMS, managed service uh, approaches or hybrid models. And uh, what's next, that will be a quite interesting discussion, maybe in a follow-up uh, webinar. All right. Uh, I have a question, a practical question uh, related mm -hmm. to what you just mentioned. Uh, do the use of Scipio and Portic 44 also means that Alpega is not directly connecting to the carriers? We are directly connected to, to the carriers. Uh, but not in the sense that we are gathering uh, the uh, telematics information from the carriers. So the big difference is, so Alpega is, has an um, ATK uh, carrier network, so we have uh, connections to 80,000 uh, carriers, but it's uh, web or EDI integrations for assigning uh, for status uh, information, but we are not connecting to their fleet boards, whatever telematics they're using. So that's what we do via Shipio P44 for kites. I have some more questions, but uh, I would suggest to, to go to uh, Michael Bulo uh, from ACO and explain his case, but that will uh, clarify a lot of uh, the questions and maybe also uh, have some more triggers for a discussion. Uh, so, uh, uh, Michael Bulow, um could you explain first a bit more about ACO, and then we'll take it away from what you have done. Yeah, sure, Martin. Uh, happy to do that. Um, so, ACO, um, I think uh, some of you know ACO already, uh, is one of the biggest uh, agricultural machinery uh, manufacturer worldwide. Um, and you see here uh, our vision statement that we recently renewed. Uh, we put the pharma into the uh, core of our activities and also uh, uh, basically put the sustainability as a very high target. So our vision statement is uh, sustainable high-tech solutions for farmers feeding the world. Uh, pretty new and uh, shared with you now. Uh, our turnover in 2020 was around 9.1 billion. We have around 20,000 people on board. Um, and in the middle, you see here that we are 
that our revenues are heavily based on the European Middle East region, where we generate almost 60% uh, of the overall revenues, um, followed by the other regions. Uh, our total freight spend uh, is around 300 million worldwide on a global basis, and we operate our business uh, within 54 plants globally. All right. Um, and maybe you can explain what kind of product lines you have because you have uh, different kind of brands, isn't it? Yeah, we are we are uh, pretty much uh, gone with uh, lots of acquisitions. Uh, so um, I think we just heard that uh, collaborating among competition is something on the horizon. What we did, we already bought our competition in the past uh, 20 years. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, yeah quite interesting. And uh, we have here defined during this journey uh, five core brands. Uh, you see here Challenger, which is, uh, let's say, known for, let's say, powerful machines in, in niche applications. Uh, we have Fend, which is probably uh, in Europe a uh, very well-known technology world market leader for everyone here in that core majority. And uh, we have the brand GSI, uh, which is uh, maybe not so known for everyone, but in that brand we are get all the solutions for grain storage and poultry equipment uh, the, on, a, on a global basis. And uh, yeah, Massey Ferguson is a very famous brand worldwide, pretty much uh, very much known to uh, every country, I would say. And, uh, and the Valtra brand is uh, specifically uh, focusing on uh, customer needs, really to customizing the products towards the specific customer needs. Yeah, and those ones are, look very impressive. Um, maybe you can talk about uh, the challenges or the automotive world and challenges. So, what can you relate to the challenges Achco is uh, facing in this in these times? Yes. Uh, so the challenges uh, that that uh, specifically Echo faced, I already mentioned, uh, is the brand variety. So we have been grown by acquisitions very heavily. You see here on the uh, top right, on the top left of the of the slide, uh, the different acquisitions that took place over the years. Uh, this actually um, uh, extended our size of the company and also the, the network size that you see on the upper right side. So rapid network expansion towards 54 plants on a global basis. Uh, another bullet is uh, more than 6,000 direct material suppliers for the factories and more than uh, 14,000 transport relations. I think this uh, basically depicts a picture of a very complex uh, supply chain, which we indeed uh, became through the different uh, acquisitions. Um, on the other side, we have uh, market volatility. Um, what does it mean for us as a challenge? It basically is uh, on the demand side uh, that the, the farmers, which are basically at the end our customers, are uh, faced with different prices on their markets. So they need to think about their investments into new machines and they can only invest heavily if the prices on their markets are, are nice. And since these prices are pretty volatile, uh, we have to be flexible in our production programs uh, on the different factories worldwide. In a, uh, another challenge, basically, and that is indeed come from the automotive uh, world, uh, is the, the thinking about commonalities of parts, uh, uh, what we already do with uh, global platforms. So our engineers are looking towards uh, engineering, let's say, product platforms, in which we then leverage the commonalities of parts in, in order to get cost synergies. But this for supply chain then means uh, that supply chains become more international because you need to supply then uh, these parts into different factories on a global basis. So these are basically the challenges that we uh, that was growing over the years, uh, which we needed to tackle. And uh, considering all these these uh, acquisitions and this brand variety, can you explain what the supply chain journey looked like in the last what, years? Yeah, looking back in time, um, I think. Uh, um, uh, we created here the, uh, the, the the strategy basically that we uh, created uh, as part of the global materials management transformation and uh, and yeah so what you need actually to to tackle all these challenges is uh, to get the people behind you and to really get one global motivation um, and one global motivation for for example is that we in every time we compare with our peers uh, we were seeing that uh, uh, the, the, the EBIT profit margin, for example, we were lacking behind our uh, competitors. So this was a 
very uh, strong message that uh, there is a big potential uh, uh, echo to basically get the synergies out of the uh, acquisitions done. So we formulated a strategy, and uh, in, the, in the strategy you see here that we wanted to develop from a short-term focus performer into a global integrated long-term partner. So when our evaluation evolution basically started, uh, our teams were very reactive and our factories and sites uh, worked independently from each other, as you can imagine. Uh, but nevertheless, we started first purchasing collaboration projects and ensured, let's say, fast resolutions for upcoming problems. During the integration phase that you see here that we went through uh, in 2015 uh, until 17, we went through a standardized global KPI assessment, which means we basically defined global targets and as well as launched a standardized global tools, which, which enabled us then basically to achieve these targets on a global basis, which uh, is here named with TMS, so Transportation Management System, which I will elaborate uh, in a few minutes uh, from now, plus also supplier network collaboration, which was basically the link to our supply base. And this enabled us to get into a competitive advantage phase that you see here on the right side of the, of the slides, in which we became more proactive and actually set the basis for a shift into integrated demand planning and we were also able to um, shift from regional control towers into global control towers. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Everybody wants uh, control towers. Uh, maybe you could explain uh, how does ECHO keeps improving over time. So where are you steering at? Um, yeah, actually, uh, as part of that journey, uh, we defined uh, uh, in, in, in initiative which is um, Echo Smart Logistics that you see here. So as core of Echo Smart Logistics, um, and as a result of uh, Echo Smart Logistics, we created a performance cockpit, um, which is accessible, um, uh, which is also basically an, uh, a cloud-based solution accessible internally for the quality materials uh, and also purchasing teams on a global basis and also externally for suppliers and logistic service providers. So in that cockpit, we are collecting uh, KPI tracking data reporting from different systems. Um, we are using the, the cockpit uh, to basically to manage our supplies and develop them uh, further. We have also integrated uh, a risk management service provider, uh, which is risk method. Uh, so they are providing us on a daily basis with uh, of operational uh, relevant information when it comes to deviations in supply chain or disruptions. Uh, so in that tool, we have digitalized all the origin destination pairs uh, that we have uh, on a global basis. We have furthermore collecting on conformities, uh, uh, obviously to uh, escalate and to work out action plans also in that tool. And uh, we are last but not least using the tool for tracking and reporting savings. So all in one tool uh, to basically have a good team really uh, uh, accessible on, on one data platform, which is uh, needed to be effective. But, but underneath there are different kinds of systems. Uh, that, that's the, the main message. But also, exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So for example, KPI tracking, uh, there's a lot of uh, KPIs that are also coming from the transportation management system. Also non-conformities are also partly uh, coming from the transportation management system. All right. Um, okay. Well, um, can you explain? So, so what were the objectives in the last few years, and what will be the new objectives? Yeah. So, uh, when we look into our objectives, uh, it was always that we uh, digitalize our supply chain uh, for the global material flows, and we follow the, uh, let's say this also today. So, we want to create uh, more transparency in the material flow. We want to still uh, keep our transportation uh, cost reduced. So over the years, we have reduced them significantly. At this point in time, we try to re remain on a very low level, obviously. So we are running already on a very optimized level. Um, we are trying to increase the network performance, mainly on-time delivery is the main KPI. And by this reliability increase, we will be able and still able to reduce further inventories. All right. 
um let, let's uh, go into the world of tms so um yeah. when you you explained uh, on this journey that you uh, well in the end you implemented uh alpega tms or maybe it's called <laughs> I so how did you start this whole journey yeah yeah when you when you start that journey uh, what you will recognize one of the biggest uh, spans that you have is basically transportation spend yeah this is this is a very very big uh, cost bucket I'm, i mentioned already 300 million globally so this is something where uh, you, which you want to leverage right you see very big potential so what the team did and this was a global team we formulated uh, basically three scenarios that you also see on the slide uh, the first scenario is uh, basically where we created uh, one central echo team and uh, completely uh, let's say run the integrated transportation management uh, process uh, inside echo with a new team uh, second scenario was uh, that this uh, new integrated uh, process was then handled by a neutral 4PL, 4PL party so a complete outsource uh, scenario and the third scenario which we you also recognize here, which is obviously a red frame, uh, which we took, uh, is a scenario in which we uh, work together on a hybrid network management basis with a neutral, neutral 4PL uh, party. So this is what we selected at the end, but uh, you need to create these scenarios uh, later, obviously, or before you start that journey to uh, tell your management what are the certain or the different uh, cost and benefit implication. Uh, and again, we went through a partner selection process, what you see in the middle, a full-blown RFQ, uh, an extension, uh, extensive uh, selection. We also invited uh, back then so-called lead logistics service providers, uh, for example, yeah, DHL and Kühne, I think names that, that some of you uh, know. And uh, but for us, it was always important that we really have someone neutrally in place that are handling that is handling and, and optimizing our network. And we always saw, let's say, a conflict of targets in that setup uh, with lead logistics service providers. So yeah, so the important was in the selection process to get all the global supply chain organization behind us in terms of decision making and to uh, create a clear business case in regards to total expected value. So not only the costs are relevant, also what kind of value can be created by the system and by the process that you implement. And there are also significant uh, differences that we saw on the market. So last but not least, uh, to make this, uh, um, let's say this long story short, we decided to go forward uh, on a global basis with uh, Forflow and Alga transportation management system. Uh, and there are very good reasons to do that. So what we saw in the business case is a rapid and also at, uh, finally in the execution is a rapid implementation uh, of, uh, of 18 months. So we were very we were even able to uh, uh, get break even uh, in less than 12 months. And I will show you in a minute what was the, what was the special thing that we did there. Uh, we have with that solution a high flexibility of planning and resources. So there is a certain scalability in the cost model included. We have more or less limited, uh, if not to say no IT investment cost uh, necessary. Uh, we are operating a software as a service uh, solution there. And we were able to, um, to agree on target definition and budget responsibility uh, to have the necessary blood pressure in the collaboration. Okay, now, hybrid is the new word uh, and the new magic, I would say. So uh, I can imagine, you know, now it's very hot to, to, to go hybrid. Um, can you explain how, how the rollout look like uh, uh, globally? Yeah, so finally, uh, what we really accomplished, uh, you see here really in facts and figures, um, is we implemented uh, the system in 34 sites on a global basis, fully connected. And uh, and it basically means here on the right side, you see the global rollout. We started in EMA in Europe. We completed this already in quarter two, 2015. Went then uh, to Asia Pacific, to our Chinese organization. Implemented this then in the quarter two, 2017. And then followed by North America and South America. So fully implemented a solution on, on one premise, uh, uh, which uh, I would say unique. So everyone really works on one system. Uh, we have globally integrated 150 carriers and uh, around 200 million spent. And again, 3,000 supplier locations, 5,000 dealer locations for outbound deliveries. And on a monthly basis, no, on the monthly basis, sorry, we are handling around 30,000 
transport orders. I imagine, you know, uh, you started out in uh, 2015 to implement it, and now we are living in 2021. So, can you say something how the, 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 the application have evolved and how things have changed in the meantime, apart from the implementation itself? Yeah. Um, the Maybe you can, can you switch to the next slide? That would uh, help me. Yeah, thank you. So, um, what was important basically for for our journey is, uh, and what was very specific to the implementation is, uh, you need to basically understand how to run the change, right? So, you need to understand your organization and what potential conflicts could occur. So, I think everyone uh, has their own uh, organization out, out there. We have a March organization. Uh, which uh, basically uh, had certain conflicts in between manufacturing and global materials management. So if you understand that and set up the right, uh, let's say, project organization and sponsor for the project, then this uh, is helping you for, for, for the success of the project on a global basis. So this is what we did. Uh, we early informed, uh, let's say, the people that are relevant, so stakeholder identification is, 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 is key and of the essence in order to bring the, net, the, the right information to the right hands at the right time. And, and, and what was very important, I mentioned that, that we reached break even already uh, after 12 months. Uh, see this here in point two, an initial network optimization. So we were not simply implementing the network as it, as it was. We basically had teams in a, for six months working locally in the manufacturing plants to already optimize uh, the existing network and to, uh, let's say, get the quick wins uh, uh, before we then uh, implemented basically the already pre-optimized network. So with that, we were leveraging the savings and finance the project, and therefore we're able also to uh, get a 12 months break even. While we were doing all this optimization work, the teams uh, in the plants collected necessary information uh, and also uh, provided this and supported the process and IT setup, which is here mentioned under point three. But I imagine, you know, it, it it's already was a, a cloud solution to start with. So that hasn't changed over the time. So you were already uh, implementing the similar kind of uh, in, uh, application at the start. Correct. Okay. Now that's good to know because things are changing in the software world uh, quite rapidly. Um, uh, you know, uh, this this sounds very smooth, but, but how do you make sure you don't have any bottlenecks along the way? Yeah, so uh, of course you are facing, uh, let's say, roadblocks, potential roadblocks. And, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, looking back at our journey, uh, we had different processes, different requirements, different carriers. And uh, and that this is this way basically to harmonize and standardize was a big, uh, big task for everyone. So what is important is, as I said early and broad internal communication to get really the necessary stakeholders uh, on board because you are influencing now processes uh, that uh, um, have happened in, in other areas and other responsibilities and you basically uh, need to explain this with good reasons, good facts and uh, I think uh, yeah, we identified uh, the right stakeholders to influence them and as I said in case of conflicts it would be uh, necessary to have the sponsor and the company the defined. Uh, what is also very important is uh, to have a good approach with the carriers. Um, so what I can also mention here is over time, uh, looking back the last uh, years, uh, we increased really the numbers of carriers, right? So we're coming from, a, I would say, handful of carriers per factory into nowadays we are handling uh, 70, 70 uh, carriers only in the inbound network. So uh, with that system, basically, you are able to handle more complexity and, uh, and this is also a very big uh, benefit of, of the system. So a timely uh, definition and alignment and contracting with the carriers is also necessary uh, because uh, everything is new, obviously, the, the process is new, uh, uh, the, the parties that the carriers need to work with is, are new and, and therefore I think this uh, is necessary to really time this uh, to bring them on board and, and after all also to contract this because there are very specific rules in the process that everyone needs to respect and uh, um, obviously you, you need to make sure in the contract that uh, this is something 
uh, for long term accessible, obviously. Yeah? So then you have the supply base. Um, as I mentioned, we had more than 6,000 suppliers on a global basis that obviously needed to be onboarded. Um, we have here uh, worked out a two supplier information letter approach, uh, which was working very fine and smoothly. And very important is obviously the trainings that you conduct with the suppliers uh, with the help of web webinars uh, and uh, record trainings. This was uh, very effectively done and can be also used sustainably going forward if you have new suppliers that you uh, take this training approach uh, in the future. Um, yeah, and uh, the local plans, uh, frequent visits, uh, gaining trust um, into the new process on a continuous basis, um, having dedicated people also from the transportation management system working with the local plan teams uh, on a on a weekly basis, uh, having meetings with the teams. That is all important, uh, again, not only for the implementation, also for the ongoing uh, operations. So I can imagine that's part of the change management, that, that, that you uh, assess the, the readiness to change and implement uh, at the sites. Exactly, exactly. So uh, again, I'm not saying that all went, went completely smooth. Again, you, we, are, we are talking about different cultures uh, uh, and uh, yeah, different expectations. So we had uh, uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, difficult meetings. Uh, but again, after all, uh, I think this was a very big success, success for, for the company, for the corporation as such. Um, but yeah. So, so what were the end results of all this? Yeah, uh, in a nutshell, uh, big transportation cost savings. So uh, we can really uh, see here on the, on, the, on the left side or on the middle center, 20% uh, transportation cost reduction with different levers that led to that overall reduction. Um, and you see them here listed. Uh, and uh, overall, we also uh, see with that visibility that we created now in the system, uh, that we are having a better network performance, mainly a better on-time delivery uh, KPI, which increased by 25%. Uh, uh, and by this, I mentioned this already, we are able with this, let's say, transparency and reliability that we can now measure with our own data, uh, we were able to reduce the days on uh, by 24% roughly. Hmm. That's, uh, well, big, you know, even in inf inventory matter. Um, and, and, and moving along, so how do you uh, keep on uh, optimizing and improving? Yeah, so uh, I think that, uh, I think Michael already mentioned that we have you have different stages. So one is the network structure, which is more long term uh, topic. So uh, understanding where to put uh, hubs into the network, but overall, uh, I think the message is that a transportation uh, management system. Uh, is is really kind of a, uh, an elephant uh, that uh, with data that you uh, uh, create and that uh, gives you all gives you all more uh, resilience. So, for example, if you have a, a different network level with a different production program at one point in time, and you, as I mentioned, the, our the volatility from the demand side leads in the next year to or even in the next quarter to a different production program. You need these uh, different alternatives uh, in the transportation modes uh, that are basically pre-set up and pre-accessible. And this is a certain resilience that is uh, really helping us uh, to get a better service level for the factories. Okay, makes sense. Um, maybe, you know, uh, you can explain, so how, how do you manage uh, uh, the ACO and, and for flow, uh you know, partnerships? Because that, that's different. So what's the hybrid uh, the form? of this yeah so um in general we are organized in i would say in three different teams uh on a global basis so uh, we have trans transportation management uh, team which is uh, the decision making team which is leading the the contractual uh, negotiation which is also uh, doing the supplier selection at the end of the day as an ex escalation point. So this is the transportation management team. And uh, uh, we have then the transportation planning team, which is a team that is focusing completely of generating savings, of optimizing certain processes together with the material teams uh, in the plants. Yeah? And then last but not least, we have the so-called execution service uh, teams um, that are focusing really on the day-to-day -day operations 
but not only on a day-to-day -day operation, they also, at the end of the day, uh, uh, are responsible for basically improving uh, certain performance uh, issues with certain providers. Therefore, also they are needed, this team is needed for reporting purposes and for running uh, improvement cycles with service providers. And uh, as you can see on the slide, this is a little bit differently organized at ECHO. So we have North America and South America that are completely having all these three teams uh, on, on ECHO side. So they basically uh, did not decide to go for a 4PL approach. So they are using the same system, the same processes, uh, again, on a global basis, but the teams are completely eco-internal teams, whereas we in, in Europe, Middle East, and then Asia Pacific, uh, we outsource the transportation planning and the ex uh, execution services uh, to for flow management. So this is uh, basically a, a big difference between the regions. But nevertheless, we are working on one system with the same processes. So, so, so why did you outsource uh, um, the tactical uh, transportation planning to Forflow and the execution part of it in Europe? Uh, basically, uh, I think that there are two good reasons. One, one is that uh, uh, Forflow uh, has uh, already the advantage of being in the market and being focused on providing services in this area. So this is really their core competence. Uh, uh, what what they what they offer to us and and we were um, uh, basically weighing between really getting our own learning curve or uh, accessing let's say the the 4PL uh, learning curve and the, the company decided back then uh, to basically use the services. So. Yeah, and I can also imagine that you know what I see in the market that European markets are a bit com more complex than the North American market. So that might be also something you know. You have more expertise needed in, in Europe, especially. Yeah, that's also, and uh, another good reason is also, uh, as I mentioned, the, the flexibility. So we are paying this completely as, as a service. Uh, so therefore, if pro production programs uh, basically up and down, uh, the, 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 the cost level basically for ECHO is then also moving. And this is obviously then also uh, in effect that uh, you cannot really demonstrate nicely if you uh, have the people really on board on your own payroll. Okay, so so what are the next steps uh, for getting ahead in test work management? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the latest innovation uh, that we're currently working on, and you see here uh, RPA, which pro potentially is uh, something that uh, most of you know, uh, is something that we connect now with uh, the transportation management system. So. When it comes to revenue recognition, this is a very important part, especially for stock listed companies like us. So we need to really prove, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the handover of our goods towards the first carrier, for example, uh, because this handover is enabling us to trigger our invoicing towards our uh, final customers. And this is a uh, was back then, or yeah, but was back then a pretty much pro process where you have a you, are, you have a paper basically that is signed in, in Germany, uh, mostly a CMR for, for cross country uh, deliveries. The CMR was then you know, handled in, in some, some uh, piles of, of papers. So we have digitalized all of that. So we have now a, a bot basically using op, uh, a, a optical character recognition to, uh, to connect basically the revenue recognition paper with the TMS the bot is uploading the paper in the transportation management system and it's, it's then also transferring this to an Amazon cloud uh, where our SAP system is uh, is accessing the Amazon cloud and is able to automatically invoice towards the, the final customer. So this is a complete nice automation uh, which enables you uh, with something that is only possible because you have digitalized your transportation management system. Otherwise, uh, you couldn't think about that. Yeah. Uh, another nice example is that what we currently do, and I think you mentioned the name already at the beginning of the presentation, is Shipio. So Shipio is a partner that we currently uh, implement on the transportation management platform, which will uh, process with uh, real-time track and trace uh, data. It's interesting to see that you know this end-to-end -end transport management uh, uh, you know platform. Uh, you know, enables you not only to look at the physical, but also the financial flows and uh, with the revenue recognition uh, as part of it. 
Ja, ja das war so das was a big uh, question from our finance organization. How can we digitalize this? How can we be better uh, in, for example, in our audit rates? So obviously for stock listed companies, uh, you you have uh, every quarter uh, spot checks from from internal external audits. And uh, and again, if if you have this uh, spread out this process and not uh, standardized, harmonized, and not digitalized. Uh, this uh, is obviously a good failure rate, but if you digitalize that um, and, and really follow up and find uh, potential failures in the process upfront and design the process accordingly, then uh, this is uh, yeah leaving less room for failures. I can imagine that you know you get a, a lot of support from the sea level because of this that you're not only in logistics transportation but also you're getting into the financial area so that's lifting also uh, the sea level support isn't it yeah so see everyone is very happy so the, we have a smiley face in front of us so very good everything well okay well thanks a lot for your explanation and there are some, some more questions we will uh, take them later on in the q a yeah. but um um mike you know um, um i can uh, um, imagine you know hearing this, that you need a real end-to-end -end, uh, TMS approach. So could you explain how that looks like and what is what is needed for that? Sure. Um, so so uh, over the last 20 years, I would say, uh, our experience condensed into one picture. So what, what we really see as uh, key success factors to implement uh, a TMS, uh, an end-to-end -end TMS, as just explained, uh, on this slide. So we see that uh, it is really driven by the supply chain strategy. So it's not only about TMS, uh, you need to, to, to get it more holistically. So really supply chain view on it. And of course that it should be the core driver. So, uh, and around this, if you look to the TMS approach, then you should think about what is the right organization for you? As, as uh, very nicely explained from Michael, uh, that can be in-house, that can be uh, outsourced, but also hybrid. So that's really the main questions uh, you should ask yourself and, and come to a conclusion. Of course, you need to design the processes uh, for, for this organization, typically uh, global template processes and regionalized uh, potentially for, for different reasons. Uh, of course, you should select uh, the right system. We have a suggestion, by the way, which one is the right one. And um, of course, uh, you need to have a look into your as is data. So data availability is quite essential because the better your data, the better you can automate and the better you can optimize. So I think that's quite essential. But what is also something we learned and saw over time is that the TMS plays a quite nice role in order to, to be a, a consolidation layer over different ERP systems. So we have very often the situation that the ERP landscape of our customers is, is, is very fragmented. And, and we are then basically playing a layer to give global visibility, uh, even though the ERP systems are different. And of course, in order to really create uh, the best performing transport network, you need to design it as explained with, a, uh, uh, with an approach of a network design, but also design your network also for the future. And with that integrated approach, you are of, of course also are much faster in replanning and, and acting on, on changes in the market. So that's uh, essential to also react very fast on, on changing market conditions. So that's, I would say, the core essence of it. And of course, how you want to collaborate with your plants, uh, with your carriers, with your suppliers and your customers. And as, as you know, we are software as a service and we are uh, believers that technology and the onboarded carriers and the onboarded suppliers are, of course, uh, a key enabler to really uh, have a best of breed end-to-end -end TMS. And just to finalize, maybe the, the essence of it, of course, everything you do and you decide typically is driven by the business case as really perfectly done by, uh, by Echo because uh, they really by the approach and by the TMS, uh, they could uh, leverage already during the project the first savings by optimizing the, their network, not just implementing as is. At first, have a look into the network, implement the optimized network already that delivers very fast, uh, very nice savings.
I have a question from the audience about that. You know, um, most of the times you already have contracts with, with carriers or 3PL companies. Um, how do you handle that? You know, is that hindering you uh, with the your network redesign? Uh, let's say, of course, if you have a uh, long lasting frame contract, uh, th that's not easy to get out there. Uh, but at the end, uh, of course, that's that's part of your overall, um, I would say, setting of the transport network. So uh, without a TS, you have quite long contract periods because it's hell of a work to, to source. With a TMS, you're get, getting more dynamic because this tendering process is, is much easier. If you have digitized your freight tender, yeah, it, it, it's a few clicks and then you, you can go for it. So with that, uh, you really create that dynamic uh, in the network and you can act faster. All right. So uh, wrapping up, we are almost uh, to the Q&A. So uh, what are the, your conclusions hearing all this echo explained? Yeah, basically, uh, so so what, what this example really nicely presents is uh, that this collaborative platform uh, we call end-to-end -end transportation management system is the enabler to, to, to create visibility. And uh, this resulted in 20% freight cost reductions while increasing the network, network performance. So that's that's really... Uh, gathering that overall supply chain uh, aspect again, so that's uh, that's the nice results we saw here, and it's it's not over. The, so the story, as as Michael explained, uh, will be uh, proceeded, and and we really expect by using um, the next level of innovation, uh, we will release more savings and and keep Echo at at the at the stage where they are so competitive advantage compared to their uh, market competitors All right um mike thank you for your conclusions uh we get into the q a um you know um before some questions i will be asking you know there will be 30 minutes afterwards when we go into the lounge so you can also talk to uh, mike michael um carolyn and myself directly in a kind of a zoom meeting uh, so after this, we have 30 minutes if you want to uh, take it uh, uh, away deeper. Um, question, you know, from my side, uh, Michael, so what do you expect from real-time visibility? And are you also looking at, well, external data uh, like the weather and traffic to have a better improvement of your transport planning? Mike, what do you expect from real-time visibility? Uh, question to me, Michael, or to the other Michael? Which uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, Michael Bulo from Echo. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is uh, very interesting. <clears throat> so we we uh, we are expecting uh, specifically for for long distance uh, deliveries. Uh, let's say to give this uh, the the right information and time, and to basically give us uh, possibilities to react faster than than, than today. Uh, be it either in production rescheduling or in finding uh, mitigation activities like rail or flying things, uh, 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 you know, to, to have this information earlier than, than today. Because nowadays, getting this information, um, yeah, it's, it's depending on, on status information that we not often get in time. So this is something, uh, yeah, looking forward to improve the process there. Um, both to Mike and uh, Michael, I was wondering, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, scarcity in uh, transport capacity, and uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, there will be more scarcity in all kind of uh, modalities. What do you do that? Can can you uh, reserve capacity in advance, or how do you handle that? Uh, so first, um, uh, I'll pick a team as uh, Michael Buckley. So Mike, so what do you expect? Can companies? already reserve capacity when there is scarcity how do you handle that and how does uh, alpega taking into account that the possible uh, planning of scarce capacity uh, basically what what uh, carolyn mentioned in in the beginning is one of uh, of the answers so uh, on the one side uh, you saw now what an end to end tms is but uh, on the other side and that's why we are heavily pushing on that end also uh, you saw that we are also um, having freight exchanges, which is basically the direct access uh, to freight capacity. So what we think will happen in the future is 
uh, that uh, besides, of course, long-term contracts, uh, these spot markets uh, or freight exchanges play a more uh, important role in the future. And what we think uh, in regards of digitization, uh, opening up those freight exchanges to the shippers will be an answer, uh, at least partially, to your question. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bulo, what do you think? Do you uh, want to reserve uh, capacity up front and do you want to have it in contract? Or do you expect that freight exchanges will help out if there is the in the next month? Um, so at this point in time, we are contracting all of our partners. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, in times where the partners are not very uh, open to contract, let's say longer term, then this is basically on uh, based on, on capacity issues, which what we see, for example, on the overseas market at the moment, that no one is, is willing to contract really for 12 months. Uh, so there we needed to go down to six, uh, six months. So this is not really helping us. And these times uh, the, our supply chains are really under fire. And uh, and again, for the at the moment, uh, we, we are not an opportunistic uh, company. Uh, we believe, uh, let's say, that uh, within a 12 months period, uh, an RFQ will show the truth of the market and uh, we remain normally, uh, let's say, uh, in that contract uh, uh, relationship in that period that we agree. Okay, thanks. Um, there's way more questions and more they can handle and we are already over the hour. So um, with this, I would like to wrap up and uh, um, I would say, you know, um, there's some more reading uh, uh, available. We have a self-assessment for visibility you might uh, be interested in. And there are also some uh, great uh, case study studies available from Alpega TMS. You see it here and you'll get uh, the direct, direct uh, links in the PDF you will be uh, uh, sent to. Um, so you can access this. Um, but like I said, you know, we will be available in the next 30 minutes in the lounge. So if you have more questions, you can uh, Ask them uh, directly and just go to the lounge after wrapping up this. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Carolyn. Thank you for uh, explaining uh, Alpega. Carolyn, thank you. Pleasure. And Michael Buckler from Alpega also. Thank you for explaining the whole approach of uh, end to end uh, TMS. Thank you. Many thanks. And last but not least, uh, Michael uh, Bulo from ACO, uh, thank you for explaining the great case, uh, impressive case of uh, the whole supply chain improvement and especially in the end-to-end -end supply chain transfer management. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and uh, to the listeners, thank you all for uh, listening. And um, well, like I said, it will be recorded and made available in 48 hours. We'll wrap up uh, next week. We will be available uh, and uh, here again with the webinar Wednesday. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank you, and maybe we'll uh, see you later in a minute in the, in the line uh, if you have more questions about end-to-end transfer management. So bye-bye, and uh, see you later, and maybe i see you in the lounge. <laughs>